Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beelance and Sen as part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Glad to be joined by my co-host and Hall of Famer, Steve Flink. And also what a privilege it is to have on as this week's guest, the creator of the Fowler Who You Got podcast. You know him for his play-by-play announcing for college football on Saturday nights. You also know him from his tennis coverage on ESPN. What a privilege it is to have Mr. Chris Fowler join the pod. Chris, thank you for uh, spending some time on the on the podcast. Yeah, David, see you, folks. That's it's my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Well, you you know, look, um, as you know, I'm both a huge college football fan and obviously a huge tennis fan. We could talk college football all night. This is a tennis podcast. We're not going to do this, but you know, I feel cheated as you are a Colorado Buffalo alum. I need to know. I need the full breakdown. September twenty fourth, nineteen ninety four. The miracle at Michigan, Cordell Stewart, Michael Westbrook, 64-yard Hail Mary. Break it down as only Chris Fowler can break it down. Well, the, the state of the alma mater is so bad right now, guys. I don't mind dialing back to 1994, thinking about a warm memory because the Buffs are struggling for Ws right now. I was in the studio that day. We didn't have the rights to the game. We were waiting to do a post-game show uh, on ESPN. ABC had the game. Keith Jackson was doing the call. And obviously, because it was right down to the wire, it was going long. It was going into our scoreboard show. So you have the uncomfortable thing of trying to update scores while games are still ending. And we get to the score panel in the studio and we've got a bank of monitors. I can watch them six or eight games at one time. I'm watching that one more than others because although I was into it, I kind of had given up. Like Colorado's chances are pretty grim. And the score panel comes up on, on ESPN, Michigan, Colorado. And I said, well, hold on one second. It's not final yet, but they're just, just going to run the one final play. And I got to do kind of a half-assed play-by-play, nothing like Keith Jackson because I wasn't prepared for it. But, yeah, I, I said, the ball has been caught. Colorado has scored. They have taken the lead. Hold on. We'll get you the highlights. I, I, I'm not coming out of my shoes because I was that excited <laughs> about it. And I wasn't that far out of school, right? I was I – was, you know, in school when they were the worst football program in the world. And then they had won a piece of a championship in, uh, in 1990. And then a few years after that, they were still really good with all the players you mentioned. So that was my uh, yeah, miracle in Ann Arbor moment. And I was, I was really cool for me to be on the air when it happened, even though I wasn't calling it in the stadium. Office. Absolutely. That, that, that's great that you were able to share that. And this is the perfect transition, I think, to the next, the next question I want to bring up to you. And it's, um, for any sports fan, this is this is amazing. But I want to hear you talk about the late August, early September prep when you have both how the start of college football and you have the U.S. Open going on simultaneously. And for any sports fans, dream sports commentator, dream that's that's unbelievable. But I I, I want to kind of pick your brain and you talk about when you first got those two responsibilities. Was it like whoa, you don't know what what side is up versus what you're doing now, you've done it, you know, a number of years. Now you kind of have it down to a science. Yeah, it's, it's my most enjoyable two weeks of the year, but also the most challenging. And I don't shy away from a challenge. You got, you got to embrace it. Um, I'm really grateful for the chance to, to call my two favorite sports at a championship level. And those two weeks a year when they collide, you just got to be up for the challenge. You'd be ready for it. There's such different sports to call. Preparation for them is really different. So over the years, I have figured out some time management skills. Basically, I'll prep for the football games before the open starts because I've got a, you know, a summer to do so. So this year was Ohio State Notre Dame, pretty monster ABC opening game uh, on the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. So I kind of get that down as much as you can because stuff is still breaking in the week of the game. So the open starts. I had just come back from Iceland because I had a a milestone birthday and my brother and my wife and I went over to Iceland. So I, it wasn't the usual U S open prep. It was just good mental health to be on glaciers and mountains and, and islands, and then come back and, and kind of dive into the open about four or five days later. So I felt a little undercooked this year on the open, but fortunately um, when you call matches, you have a chance to work your way into it. Like I don't have to be like, you get out of every single plot line of the U S open simultaneously with, you know, all 256 singles players, top of mind. Um, so I'm juggling week one. Like I'm doing matches two a day. And in between the matches, I'm going off and trying to find a quiet place where Brad Gilbert isn't and the other <laughs> tennis family. I love them. I love them, but it's very social, guys. It's very social at the U.S. Open. And it isn't good for focusing on something other than tennis. 
So I find a quiet office, get my little chart out there. I don't know, no one listening can see it, but if you're watching it, this is a very like elaborate board that you do for football prep. And it has you know, both teams on it. And how well you can see it. This is not filled in yet, but as it gets filled in, it's got tiny little writing everywhere. And you're watching tape, looking at notes, making phone calls, having Zoom calls. That's the normal week of prep for college football. When it intersects with tennis, it doesn't leave a lot of spare time. But again, I leave to do the opening game, and then I will not leave the open for week two. I did it once. I didn't like it. Um, I actually did the men's semis, flew to Columbus for the Baker Mayfield planting a flag in Ohio State's field mm-hmm. game. Did that game, jumped in the plane after the game, came back so I could call the men's final. I did miss the women's final, which I hate to do, and I don't do that anymore. So week two, I'm just locked in on tennis, and it's 100%. But, um, yeah, those are those are two um, amazing weeks for me, and um, I wouldn't trade it. No, thanks for thanks for sharing that, Steve. I, I know uh, I'm going to pass it on to you. I know you want to ask Chris about a little bit about his background, how he got into playing tennis. And, and again, uh, I think following up there, you want to talk a little bit about Labor Cup and what a special special week that was as well. Yeah, Chris, just give us give the listeners an idea. They, they, they obviously know how immersed you are in tennis and they've heard you calling these majors for a long time now. And I know that initially I remember seeing you often in the studio with Brad Gilbert before you started actually calling the matches. But just trace back a little bit to your, the passion you developed for the sport and did you ever see yourself it becoming quite as prominent as it has in, in your life and your work? Yeah, see, my playing career is a very short sentence. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I played this as a kid. We had a, we had a court uh, very nearby. Um, I, I, I loved it. And when, when, when Jimmy Connors came along in 1974 and Chrissy on the women's side, I embraced it. I, I preferred the younger players to the legends. I didn't care that much about Laver and I mean, Newcomb and, and Ken Rosewall. I, I was more into Jimmy and the younger guys. And I got a T2000, which I couldn't play with. I put that down after about two weeks. Got a, got a Borg Donna racket because I had a two-handed backhand and the grip was long. And I, I kind of like kept searching for the right racket to improve my game. And it was, <laughs> it was a struggle. I was a decent player, um, but, but I, I was never going to go anywhere. I was never going to get a college scholarship with it. I, I knew that. But I loved it and I watched it. And I couldn't tell you exactly where I was for the, you know, 1980 McEnroe Borg tiebreak in Vail, Colorado at a friend's condo watching it. You know, early in the morning out there in the mountain time zone. And, and, and that's just, for me, tennis has always been um, a sport that I'm passionate about as a spectator. These days I don't play as much. I've had operations on both shoulders, so they kind of need to be unlocked a little bit. But I live most of the year down in Miami Beach. There's a place called Flamingo Park where they used to play the Orange Bowl. They have a whole bunch of, of you know, hard true courts down there. It's very strong tennis community you can usually find a game if you show up there might be a pro to hit with there's a wall to hit against so i, I try to do that as much as i can in the winter and kind of knock the rust off be, because i do love it and uh so far i've resisted the many invitations to switch over exclusively to pickleball but those those are constantly out there but so that, that's sort of my my playing career and, and and just in terms of you know being being lucky enough to call it in 2003 we finally got substantial rights at ESPN. So they would let me out of college basketball, which I went right into after football season and obviously collides with everything. It collides with um, the Australian open and all the, the masters tournaments in the spring. And, and, you know, I I was able to get out of that, go to Australia in 03. We had Wimbledon in 03. We, we arrived in Wimbledon our first year to cover it. It It's pretty good timing. You might remember who won that, that men's title sure. in 2003. So Roger arrives. We arrived. Yeah. It was all a beautiful alignment of things. And we, at one point there had all four majors, which was incredible. I mean, now we're down to two on site. The Australian has not done that way anymore. So it's not the same. And then we had all the masters events. I just, I, I couldn't do as much tennis as I wanted to. And, and I loved it. And, and just working with that tennis team, we can get into that if you want to, but the different personalities, it's such a different thing than football where I worked with Kirk Herbstreit in the booth and, and on Saturday mornings and game day for 27 years. And this basically one announcer in the booth for, for most of my play-by-play career. And tennis, as you know, it's a, it's a changing cast. It's, it's two analysts in a day, very different. The job I do is very different with them, but it's been awesome to, 
to hang around them, learn from them. Because every time you do a match with, with Patrick or John or Darren Cale, Brad, Chrissy, Mary Jo, you learn a lot. And I, I just sponge all that up and, and fed off of their knowledge and, and their passion for it. So. But Chris, before we get to the Labor Cup and the big three, I, I just want to get briefly your philosophy. You talk about calling the matches play by play. You're surrounded by all these great expert commentators, former players. It seems to me that the role of the play by play man in your eyes and many others, by the way, has changed. In other words, from the days of uh, going back to Bud Collins or Dick Emberg or uh, Tony that the play that in in the old days the play by play man didn't get into as much analysis. You love the analysis, and uh, you get right into it with with Brad and 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 PMAC and and all the rest, and and that's that seems to be the the modern way of doing it. Was that something you came into it believing you wanted to do, or it evolved? Talk about the changing role of the play by play man. That's a good question, Steve. I think it has evolved. I think I think. Television coverage in all sports has evolved. In general, I believe the viewers are more informed. Um, they're more adept at multitasking. They can sort of take more input. In fact, in fact a lot of viewers sort of demand that. Um, I, I would say that I do tennis analysis to the extent that I, I love the data piece of it. I, I'm very much up on the Hawkeye data. I take a lot of it in. And, and I would offer, hopefully not smother the broadcast. We work hard not to do that because I don't think you can over-prepare for any broadcast, but you can certainly overuse your preparation. And that's something I've been guilty of and, and others are too. But that kind of analysis, just studying tape, previous matches, reading the articles, talking to coaches, being around the tennis culture as much as I can, I try to stay out of the technical stroke side of things. And I certainly say out of the mind of a tennis player, like I have, have no idea what goes on inside of a, a competitive tennis player's mind. And I, I, the more I learn, the more I'm puzzled about it. That's for those analysts I mentioned to unravel. And I find that piece of it fascinating, but I try not to intrude in that, in that world. I might say, hey, Rafa's probably thinking here because I've talked to him about that situation or I've just observed so many matches of these top legends, male and female, that I... I have a good sense of, of the flow of a match, what they might be thinking and how they might react. But normally, that's the analyst world. Um, and, and you mentioned Dick Enberg. He, he was the guy through whom I viewed tennis matches when I was a kid. His sense of humanity, that, that these are people out there. They're not fantasy figures. They're not you know, entities that you bet on. There are human beings out there, and, and that's the beauty of it, right? All, all the human frailties, all the human wonderful qualities are all on display out there by yourself on the court. That's what's very powerful to me about tennis. And Dick always brought home the humanity. His feel for Wimbledon was why I think I began to love the tournament. And every time I get to go to the center court bunker and do a broadcast from that amazing vantage point underneath the friends box there in center court, the same place Dick sat when I listened to all those matches in the 80s and 90s, man, I just, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I, I'm so grateful and so appreciative of that experience because he was the guy for me that, that sort of taught me how, how this should be done, more so than the other guys you named, um, because I think he had a special, special feel for it. Now, Dick's style, he, he would be the first to say you have to evolve and change. I think when he came to ESPN, it was a little different. Um, I still think there's a place for that to pull back and be a wordsmith and, and, and just have a gentler touch. But, um, you know, these aren't very gentle times in sports. So I think we do do a, a more crowded, more talkative, um, more data rich broadcast than we did in those days. So Chris, the, just to tack onto that, let's just take a look a little uh, two two prong question: The Labor Cup. Did you watch it? How moved you were? How poignant was it for you to see Federer in tears, surrounded by players who were almost as emotional as he was? And part two: You don't get a chance to really get into this in the air, but I'd love to know your thoughts on the goat argument as it stands right now, yeah. with Feder with Federer retired and the other two still going strong. I love the Labor Cup. First of all, Steve, I went to it in Chicago. Um, Tony got sick. Rogers manager. Good. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm connected. I had pretty good setup there. I, I, I raced there on a Sunday 
that because I was doing football on Saturday, but I, it came down to Curios and Federer. I think I mean, it was, I thought it was electric inside United Center. So I, I'll watch the labor got any chance I get, which it's tough when it's in Europe in the middle of football season. That's the problem. Yeah, I watched that, Steve. I, I was as moved as anybody else. I mean, I, I have great affection and respect for both those guys. And, and those guys together are even greater than they are individually. You mm -hmm. put them in any kind of environment and it's just so ultra compelling because if you know the history, you know that it wasn't always Kumbaya. They weren't always great friends. When, when Roger was the king and Rafa was the chaser, I promise you everyone in Rafa's camp was fiercely competitive about Roger. And I think he saw a serious challenge. And I think it's very hard at that stage in their career to be good buddies. That came later on after so many matches against each other and so much mutual respect. And just, you know, you're, you're not, neither one's like the young lion anymore, right? So to watch that, that emotional display in London, it was powerful and beautiful on a number of levels. One, although I wish I'd seen Roger at the US Open, I wish he was coming back next year. You know, that kind of a thing with Nadal playing doubles where he only has to cover half the court. And that was a good thing because you saw that he's still very limited in his movement. And then the other side of that, Two dudes with not an ounce of sentimentality. And that's another thing that I find beautiful about sports. You know, I mean, Salah and Seattle, they don't care about it. They, they want to win the match. They want to win it for themselves. They want to win it because they could say they were the guy who beat Federer in his last match. I mean, imagine being on the rocking chair. Every tennis player of the last three or four generations. Did you ever play Roger Federer? Yeah. I did. As a matter of fact, I beat him in his last match. I mean, who, who wouldn't want that? I mean, that was a powerful, motivating thing. And I, the way it played out, you know, sports aren't always that storybook ending. And that certainly wasn't for the people there in London and most of the people watching on TV, me included. But you know what? I, I found a power and a, and a beauty in that. Yeah, Chris, I just want to add, before we talk about the, the, the GOAT debate, um, I thought it was the perfect ending for, for Roger. Rather, he said he would wind up doing it in Basel or Wimbledon. I thought him pairing up with Rafa, his most fierce rival, also his most fierce friend, I thought it was the perfect ending. You've covered a lot of sports. Well, they were this close, right? They had match points. So the perfect ending yeah. for us. What, what are you talking about, David? It does, the, the result, ending is the result win is, the match. <laughs> the result's inconsequential to me as time goes on. It really is. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, um, you've covered a lot of unbelievable sporting moments, college football, college basketball. The Friday night, you you said the emotion and everything, and again, the the result to me is inconsequential as time goes goes by. I'll put that moment up in sports against any really special special moment in sports. Do you feel the same way? I think, as terms of goodbyes, yeah, absolutely, because I we have a feel for the sport and I have a feel for the guy, and and the fact that it was Rafa right there next to him. I mean, I, I think you're right. It it was a a perfectly scripted scenario except for the result but I, I do think that that uh that goodbyes to legends have a power I, of course I was choked up I, I did a video about it in Texas in a hotel room after a couple of drinks after seeing it just to document I was getting choked up doing the video <laughs> so I would have been a mess if I tried to call it Jim Courier is a good friend of mine held it together pretty good on the court given what was going on there <laughs> so now what tell us your thoughts on the goal I mean, with Federer gone, Djokovic and Nadal still, Novak conceivably playing for three more years with his physical state, and Rafa, we don't know. But as it stands right now, what is your stance? Man, you want a one-word answer, and I'm just not a one-word answer guy on this, Steve. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer, and I won't back away from it. I do think that it's important to remember that this is such a personal, subjective thing. And I think what, what I've said before is that stats, achievements, there's the resume, there's the trophy case. That's important. But I think people's opinion of a player when you're at that level in any sport is based largely on how they made them feel, how they made them feel when they watch them play. And in that regard, there's a reason why Roger is the most popular player maybe in any sport ever. And because he made people feel just like a tingling feeling, the way he made tennis look so beautiful and so classic and so effortless. And then, then even when he was being uber aggressive and actually changing the way it was being played, he still did so 
with style and grace and elegance and was the way he walked on and off the court and comported himself and everything around the tournament and lived his life. So I think he made, he made people feel a, a different way for me right now. I'm not going to give you that answer though. I mean, for me right now, Nadal has that title that could change. As you said, Djokovic is more likely to play longer and maybe pile up a greater number of major titles, add on some other things. I don't think major titles is the only thing. I think weeks at number one, year end number one, head to head, it all factors in. Uh, it's so close with Roth, with uh, Rafa and Novak in, in the head to head piece. And, but to me, I always embraced the fact that he was the chaser for so long. So many, and he always saw himself that way as the underdog whenever he faced Roger or Novak and worked so hard to improve his weaknesses and expand his game and go from a clay king to annexing Wimbledon and then especially annexing hard courts as a surface where he's achieved amazing stuff. And, and the way that he's battled and come back and the fact that he's just so humble and so regular. I've always really connected with that. Novak is the most thoughtful, interesting athlete I've ever covered. And I've gotten to know him over the years. We've had some great conversations about non-tennis stuff. and really he's i've learned from him and he's always been very engaging to me and, and he's always difficult for a lot of people but man he's, he's taken an interest in what i post on instagram or the podcast he, he's very he's very deep overly complicated sometimes to get the job done on the court i think he gets in his way a little bit mentally but obviously at his highest level if you're going to say like whose highest note is best it's I, to me it's Djokovic, but you know, right now, I, I would give us the slightest edge to it all. Good answer. Boo. People are booing. So, <laughs> very thorough, very thorough, very thoughtful response. Steve, uh, you a, know, it's a uh, fluid question. It's, it's a, it could change. You know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I know, uh, Chris. I know Steve and I wanted to go into a little bit of the 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 commentating. Um, the commentating that experiences you have. I mean, again, you've mentioned the names, Brad Gilbert, Patrick McEnroe, um, Chrissy. I mean, you've worked with, with legends of the sport. I'll let, let Steve, you know, ask a little bit more about that. I think Steve, you, we wanted to talk about maybe the challenges a little bit about that. Chris, you've touched on a little bit and that yeah. you don't want to go into the player's mind. Cause you know, the people you've worked with have been at that highest level of that respective sport. And Steve, yeah. add on to that, please. Yeah, no, the only thing I'd add on, Chris, is how do you adjust your game to the, the people that surround you in the booth? Because they all have different strengths. So you have to adjust to bring out the best in them as well. I'd like to hear about, a little bit about that because you've got a lot of very gifted commentators uh, at ESPN. Yeah, that's for sure. And we, we spend a lot of time together too. I mean, they're all really great friends and the, the tennis commentating teams or it's pretty social so you're in the booth for what four or five hours at a time sometimes um over over two intense weeks but then you're you're at dinners and you're, you're walking around you're watching practices you're you're hanging out you're in bars it, it, it's it's fun to have these experiences and get to know these people you know 2003 i went to australia and i called the williams sisters final with mary carillo and it was the first slam I'd ever covered that way and had no business calling women's final but Serena was going for the Serena slam and she got it in, in that there and and I I wasn't prepared for that I didn't ask for the assignment um I was doing as you as you said more studio work then and kind of sort of like traffic copying the operation doing a lot of the player interviews and and having these fun studio segments with the cast of characters would rotate through that was what I did more really in football as well at that time so it was a very natural flow into a sport that I loved and the challenge was real when you're trying to keep, as I said before, I don't have to worry about every storyline of the tournament. Chris McKendry has to do that now. But back then it was a serious challenge to do that and then call matches because one is meta and one is very narrow, as you guys know. And, and I just, I got through that. That is a cringe fest for me. If I, if I ever listened to one clip of that Aussie Open final, I think Mary was like, who's this guy? I mean, she wasn't <laughs> sure what was going on. I don't blame her. Um, but I was pretty shitty. And, and so it's, I, I have no problem with humility. I think we always have to improve all the time. I still feel that today. I want to be a better commentator this year than last. And it's, 
I think it's not just a desire, it's essential to continue to grow and improve. And I had a lot of work to do back then. So it was a, it was a baptism that, that I didn't ask for and I didn't handle all that well. I mean, I didn't embarrass myself, I guess, but it, it wasn't, didn't meet my standard. So over time, as you get more experience and tennis commentary really takes experience. I feel badly when people get thrown into it that aren't immersed in the sport, haven't done it before because there's so much discipline required in doing it. You guys know it, it, it isn't a, a see it, say it sport, which football is to some degree and hockey and basketball. Um, it, it's a, it's a see it, see it, think, think, think what you're going to say could change five times in a point. If it's an extended rally, right? You might say nothing because that might be the best thing to say at the end of a point is zero, but all those things are, are tumbling around in your head and you're making a lot of micro decisions when you do that. So trying to be, you know, in the zone, I call it relaxed intensity, and, and that's necessary. I mean, no one, whether you're calling a match or playing a match, can be in there 100% of the time. You're going to have points where you, you lapse. You just hope you don't make a terrible enforced error. Then you can snap back in. It's, it's like a player, but the, the trick is to do that as well as you can, as long as you can, even if the match is five hours and 53 minutes, in the Australian Open going until like, well, I don't know what it was, two in the morning um, <laughs> for, for Novak and Rafa. But it's a challenge that I love. And it's a, it's a collaborative thing, not just the person in the booth, but folks in the control room, people around the cameras. It's, a, it's a, beautiful, a beautiful dance with a lot of people who love their jobs, take it very seriously, have earned the right to be there at those positions. And, and so the collaborative nature of it is a beautiful thing. And, and it, it, the main part of it is in the booth, but it's so much bigger than that. Let me ask you this, Chris, and, and I hope this answer changes the next time we do this in 10, 15 years, where maybe you retire 20 years, whatever it may Did be. Did you say 10 or 15? 20, you oh. know. <laughs> the, my, like question is this. <laughs> my question is as follows here. I mean, the proudest moment you've had in the booth and the best match you have ever covered. Now those could be two different moments. They could be the same thing. And again, these answers may change when we do this again. And like I said, 10, 15 years, but um, at this point, you know, what, what would you say is your proudest moment in the booth and the best match you have ever covered? The, the, those are really good questions. I mean, I've been lucky. I, I, I was courtside for, for the Federer in 2008, not calling. We didn't have the final rights then. I was a spectator. Okay, like, you're going to top that as a fan? I mean, Brad Gilbert and I were sitting there. It's a long story. We'll tell it another time. But, you know, while well, those rain delays, Gilbert had tapped out. He was, he couldn't, his body couldn't take the tension of going back up to center court after the rain. Like, I had to physically grab, Brad, you're not effing missing this. Come out of the court. Of course, it's getting dark and it's going to be held over till Monday. That, I don't think the drama of that can be topped as, a, as really any sporting event that I've seen, much less match. So, that was one I think that I think most people who, who were there would, would, would agree with that. Um, I did call the, the Nadal Djokovic, you know, 553 final when they just they turned each other inside out and just gave everything and, and played at a level that was incredible. Um, but there have been comebacks. I mean, Federer's street fight, five set comeback over Nadal in the Australian Open final when he, you know, he, he, he just beat Roth at his own game that day. And it was an amazing thing to see. And, and I mean, I, I could go on and on. I, I think what's what, what I'm very proud about, though, two things. One, one might surprise you. Awful blowout matches, which we all have. I mean, I think tennis at its best, as you guys probably wouldn't disagree, is as sublime and amazing as any sport can be at, at, at when it's, it's most beautiful, most competitive, most compelling. There are a lot of matches that fall well short of that. And it can be <laughs> way down the scale of, of, of sports drama when it's just a crappy straight set route in front of a small crowd, right? And I, but I am proud of, even when that happens, not to quit on a match, not to just be jaded and sit back and say, this sucks, this fell short of expectations. I wanna be somewhere else. I wanna be calling a better match on a different court. Those are easy, normal impulses to have, but you, you can't, you can't allow yourself to fall into that trap. So I'm proud of the matches that, that, you know, Brad and Darren and I have done at various tournaments that are not majors and it's not a very compelling match, but we found a way 
to keep the audience engaged and entertained as much as you can. And those guys playing off each other is a big part of that. Me setting it up, me sitting back, whatever it is, or, or poking and prodding Brad, getting him wound up, finding the humor, whatever it is, I'm really proud of making a bad match watchable. In terms of the great matches, I mean, just documenting, I would I would have said if Serena could get that grand slam or Novak could get that grand slam. I mean, we, we just came so close to some massive achievements in, in recent years. But Andy Murray's first win to Wimbledon, I'm really proud of all three of us who were in the booth because it was a straight set match. But as you guys know, there was so much tension there when he played Novak and closing that out, the 77-year drought of male champions, and what it meant to everybody in the UK and everybody in Senate Court, everybody in the Hill, and certainly to all of us. And, and to be so invested and engaged. And I, I like Andy enormously. He's one of the favorite personalities in the sport. That, I, that I've gotten to know and I've gotten to know him pretty well beginning when when Brad was coaching him. So God, I'm a little emotional right now thinking about it. We, we just documenting that match, what went into it, I'm able to go out and hold serve. And I'm sure you guys will remember and other fans will remember too, as he's trying to close out the biggest moment of his life, one of the biggest moments in British fans, it's 40 love. It's, yeah. it's 40 love pretty quickly. And, mm -hmm. and John and Patrick and I, without talking about it, just decided to say nothing. So three points happened. All right, triple championship point. Then Djokovic wins three points in a row, and we're back at Deuce. And 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 then I think John John said something which is so beautiful and so perfect. And he says things like this almost every big match they work with him. He goes, "I can't hold my breath any longer." And it was it was just the perfect thing to say because everyone felt that. I mean, we didn't say a thing for six or seven points. I don't know if he took a breath. And, and he said that, and we, we laughed about it. And then it gets to break point. If Djokovic breaks there, anything, anything could happen in that match. Murray could literally blow it and choke. It could, it could happen. We'd, we've seen things like that. Matches turn on a dime, especially when Novak's involved. But he, he serves it out. And, and I just I remember just having the right words that came to me then and just being able to document that moment. And he climbed right over top of our bunker because they didn't have the little stairs in the door at that point. He just came right up and over. There's a leg, that ankle brace that he wore like right in front of us. And, and I, I was really proud of, of you know, having the restraint to, to just sit back and let that happen. And we've, I think all of us have, have taken that model. I don't think it taught us that we knew that before, but it reinforced it. I think a lot of big matches, if you listen to Three of us do. Chrissy's in the same situation. We do our finals together. You know, having the restraint to just let it play and, and let the cameras and the players do the talking. So I, I was proud of that because we didn't say a lot. But then when you have to find the words at the end, you know, Andy Murray's moment, the great British drought is over. You know, a few, few other things after that. I, I, was, I was pleased and proud of that. But, um, but I, again, I'm so grateful that there have been other things like that where, you know, you, you'd have to be an idiot to screw it up. I mean, it's this <laughs> stuff that's happening in front of you. The stuff that's on screen is so amazing. Just play your part. Don't overplay your part and, and be grateful for what you get to, to, to document in some small way. I mean, when I, when I hear championship calls play back, they play them in the stadium. Sometimes they play them in montages. I cannot tell you how, how grateful I am that, that I got to be the one sitting there, at least, at least in American TV, and, and put a voice on that because um, to me, I don't get caught up in legacies, but I'm not going to ever forget that. I might sit back on YouTube 10 or 15 years. I don't be doing this, but I, I will be listening and watching matches. And I might, I might listen back to one or two of those because I'm, I'm very proud to have been a part of it. That's, that's great that, that you're able to share this. And I know we want to be appreciative of your time. Thank you so much again. Um, well, well, we want to wrap up with, with a couple points on social media. And look, you're doing this podcast. You have your own podcast, which we're, I'm, I'm going to talk about in a second. But um, you're, you know, you do your nightcap videos on Instagram. You you interact <laughs> with people on Twitter. You, you Steve, seen our know, tequila, I'll, I'll you seen our on tequila drenched football ones. <laughs> yeah. I'll pass it on to Steve. I, I I know you have a question for him about you know the, the responses that he gets from both sides, the the people who love what you say and the people that hate what you say. And I'll leave it to Steve to to add on. Yeah, I mean, social media, it, it's it, obviously, Chris, some some are, are I've spoken to some, one or two commentators whose names I won't mention that dropped off of Twitter because they were so sensitive to the excessive criticism. But how much attention do you pay to it? 
uh, or depending on who it might be or whether you know them or don't know them? And or is it better to just simply ignore it and try to do your job? How, how do you uh, weigh all that and deal with all that? Well, we do this job for a customer. The viewer is the customer. So what they think matters. We're not doing it in a vacuum. Um, I think in life, Steve, I'm pretty balanced in that whether it's on social media, on the street, in my own home, um, I, I don't take compliments for criticism to heart that much. I, I think that you listen to it. You, you certainly need feedback. I'm, I'm, I, I think I have plenty of humility about what I do. I know that there's always a lot of room for improvement. And, but I, I think in, in life in, in general, meeting your own standard is way more important than worrying about what other people think, as long as you have high standards. And I promise you, anybody out there that, that thinks, you know, I stunk calling a match, they don't feel any stronger than I do. Not nearly as strong. As a matter of fact, so, um, you know, Twitter is a toxic place, not, not just about tennis feedback. I mean, it's just it's just a toxic place, period. It's a lot of people on there that are really unhappy and angry and or, or, or maybe not as much as they seem to be, but it's just an outlet for that stuff. So I'll go there occasionally. I mean, I, I, I have many more people follow me there than on Instagram. But the Instagram community is, is a little bit different. I think it's it's less angry, less hostile, more accepting. And I think I just like the content you can post there because whatever many characters Twitter is these days, it's not the same for me as, as turning on my phone and doing a video or showing pictures or hanging out and put talk to Johnny Mac, talk to Brad, to, talk to Chrissy. I mean, it, we have fun with that. And Instagram is a good place for that. But, you know, listen, I, I, as I said before, when I was new to tennis and people didn't know who I was or why I was covering tennis matches, I'm a football guy. What do I think I'm doing? Um, I understand that. I get it. I mean, I think you have to earn respect and trust. Um, if I haven't done it by now, I'm probably not going to. The one thing I will say that I find a little bit troubling when I look at it is people are convinced that you have personal things against players. They are going to listen and watch through their own lens, you know, Fed fans don't want to hear you praise Novak because that means you're you're not praising Roger or you're you're somehow creating some friction there. And I, you know, Serena's fans are very passionate about her. And if you sometimes have to tell the truth today, hey, she didn't play well. Ugh. You know, they can get bothered by that. And I I understand how sports fans work. I cover college football. Okay, and that's what I was going to say. No you see it with with Kirk, right? With Ohio State, when Kirk does oh, an yeah. Ohio State game, I mean. Every time I mean, he has something bad against Ohio State, oh, you're you're not a Ohio State, you know, I mean, you're a bad it's interesting Ohio about, State alum. I mean, you hear the nonsense. But um, we also thread a line here. You, you guys listen to commentary in other countries, okay? American viewers probably don't have that chance very often. So they don't really know the global landscape and how biased toward home players they are in Australia and France and England and everywhere else, okay? Now, at ESPN, is it better for our broadcast? Is it better for our production if Serena keeps winning? Absolutely. Absolutely. And other American players on the women's side. And, and on the guy's side, it's better to have Tiafo in the semis or the final. It's better to have these legends of the game versus players that are lesser known. But you can't let that, you know, color your commentary, even though you're, you're sort of rooting for a story for the thing. When you call the match, you cannot... You cannot waver. Now, I, I, have I been guilt-free of that all the time? Yeah, that's for people to judge, you know. But, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get too caught up in, in sort of commentary that comes from a place of I love my player and I hate the rest of them. Because <laughs> that's, not, that's not my way of viewing this sport or any sport. If you, if you love Novak, but you can't also find it in your heart to respect Nadal and Federer and anybody else, I don't get that. And I feel sorry for those people. I really do. I, I, you can be a passionate fan, love your guy, but not direct hatred at his rivals. I, that's what I think. Well, Chris, we, we appreciate your time again. We want to end it. Um, appreciate you doing the podcast with us. You have your own pod. It's called uh, Fowler Who You Got. You've had tennis people on it. It's great. You had Johnny Mack on it not too long ago. Very interesting. Um, Talk about your enjoyment about doing that, and, and we'll we'll end on that note. Well, thank you. You're, you're kind to, to, to promote it. it. Yeah, it's not really a sports podcast. 
We have a lot of people who talk sports. Obviously, John was there. We talked some tennis. We talked his history a little bit, but I did not want to make it, you know, the best of John versus Borg or Jimmy or Vetus. I, I wanted to talk about John, the person whom I know very well. He's, he's a Renaissance man that has lots of interest. We talked a lot about rock and roll and his guitar playing yep. and being wanting to make a band with his wife, Patty, and, and things like that. And Darren Cahill was on, talked about the art of coaching. And it was tennis centric, but it also talked about getting in the minds of the athletes and the coaches tricks, I think, apply to lots of sports, which interested more people because I, I wish that the universe were loaded with tennis obsessed people. And I wish that they listen to my podcast, but they're there mainly for other things. So we, we, we have all kinds of, of, of different experts on there. And, and, and it, it's fun for me to do the research. We had an episode on tequila and an episode <laughs> on bourbon. With, with the premier people to produce my favorite brands in both of those spirit categories. I learned a lot about both things just in the course of researching it. And, you know, we don't make any money in the pot. It's just, it's just sort of like a creative outlet and, and a way to have fun. So I didn't want to make it just like the stuff you hear me do on TV. And, and it's definitely not. Steve, uh, we covered a lot with Chris and I, I, I've had a great time talking with you, Chris. Appreciate it. I'll leave it to Steve for any final thoughts um, with this. Oh, Chris, no, just a last quick question. You kind of talked around it, talked at it, but you're, you're, if you had to choose two or three, your two or three most, the players you most enjoyed watching, forget just as an observer, as a commentator, could you do two or three stand out to you now? that maybe are not even members of these, this iconic trio that we have uh, spoken about at length earlier in the podcast. Oh yeah, I think you have to, I mean, I would almost, you know, sort of like set aside those people, those, those, those folks are, are givens. Um, you know, we, pe people who are, who are the colorful characters of the sport. Who, I mean, Guy Monfils is always going to be interesting because he's such a compelling athlete. His athleticism would translate to other sports um, I find Curios tremendously compelling. Sometimes I'm a little uncomfortable watching him because I don't want Nick to get in his own way. And I, I, I've, I've seen a lot of his matches, even ones I don't call. And I, I see him getting in his own way. And I, I don't want to play amateur psychiatrist when I do his matches, but I'm very interested in topics like that. I've been around so many athletes in different sports and the mental part of it fascinates me. So it's super compelling, Steve, for me to watch him. And I think it's better that he's sort of managed those challenges lately and gotten deep in tournaments I, I will always you know find him compelling and you know I, I think that you know then you've, you've got you know players who who are so like dazzle you with their offbeat styles I mean I used to I used to love like Fernando Gonzalez because he hit the ball so damn hard I mean I, I just in the, in the era before everybody had a huge forehand I mean I mean I'm leaving I'm gonna I'm gonna get off this and say oh there's like a dozen other women and men that I, I could have thought of. But um, I think the players that have flair and, and bring their own style and, and don't play tennis by the book, I think I, I find you know, incredibly compelling. I mean, I, I, we didn't talk about it, but this new generation, like I find Alcaraz incredibly compelling. I mean, I think he is it. I, I saw him, I knew before, you know, we watched him for years as a young guy, you know, banging around a little bit, not that many years, but a couple. And then I, I was out of Miami, followed him for the outer courts before he got the assignments inside Hard Rock City and, and won the title. And then every other chance I get and being able to call his rise and his win at the U.S. Open, I didn't add that because it's so fresh. People would go, what are you talking about? To me, guys, that's a moment. Like, I didn't call Rafa's first Grand Slam or, or Novak's. I was, I was there for them but I wasn't on the mic to be able to have that moment in the U S open and see Carlos Alcaraz build that tournament and just what he managed to accomplish to get to the final, all those five setters. I'll never forget. I'll never forget Alcaraz center. I don't care how long I do this, that match, the level that those guys played at improving in front of our eyes, raising the modern level of the men's game. I think in a three hour period, as they pushed each other, I, yeah, I'm going to break it into a sweat talking about it. That, that kind of a match, and then Alcaraz finishing the job with poise. I, I said it a couple of times. I got accused of overusing the phrase. But he's just built different. 
mentally and physically. And the way that he served that match out, you're not supposed to be able to do that, right, guys? I mean, they have John and Patrick. There is context. You're just not supposed to be able to do that. So I, I just said at the end, you know, not just a, a prodigy, but a, a special one. And I, I do believe that. So I hope he continues to, to build on his potential and, and, and construct the kind of career that many people think he will. Cause I can say, I, I saw him on the outer courts of Miami. And then of course, on Arthur stadium when he, when he won his first major. Chris, thanks so much for your time tonight. We, we look forward to watching your uh, continued amazing coverage with Kirk on Saturday nights, college football, and then also uh, all your great coverage of ESPN tennis. This, this was a privilege. Thank you. Uh, David, it's my pleasure. And Steve, you know, honored to talk tennis with you, and we'll do it again sometime. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks so much.